All right, everybody. Last but not least, we've got John Corn up from Cheap Ramen Studios going through the origins of Juicy and how you juice your game and your brand and all sorts of stuff like that. And the floor is yours, John. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, this is on origins of Juicy. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, how to juice your game, but more so how to think about uh, the thought process of juicing your game. There's some really great examples of what is juice uh, that I think are, are, you know, are excellent and they're out there in the world uh, for you to use, but uh, more so they should come from you and from your own uh, head and your own designs. And uh, you should have like a process and uh, like a thought process of when you look at your game, you could be like this right here is how I'll make my game juicy. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's dive right into that. Okay, so uh, quick intro, I'm John Korn. I'm a, a developer and artist and, and co-founder of Cheap Ramen Games. Uh, these are some previous games I worked on. Um, they're all decently juicy uh, because this is really what I love doing. I love uh, those little feely parts that uh, just make the game interesting even when the gameplay is like okay uh but just how do we get that like tiny bit more of interest out of it okay. uh we, i work out of a, a gumbo uh that's that's where i am now uh it's a, a game uh, independent game developer collective in uh, brooklyn new york uh we're in the dumbo neighborhood because every new york neighborhood needs uh, a name so it's uh, down under the manhattan bridge overpass so we are uh, games under the manhattan bridge overpass, uh, but you can just call us Gumbo. Uh, anyway, uh, it's great. If you're ever in New York, feel free to hit me up and uh, come by when it is safer to do so. Okay, great. So first thing I want to show uh, is Meow Pow, uh, or the trailer for Meow Pow. Uh, Meow Pow is Cheap Ramen's uh, first title. Uh, it's currently free to play on Steam. It will always be free to play, uh, You know, so no rush to get it. Um, so let's uh, let's watch that. Okay, great. So that was uh, that was the Meow Pow trailer, and I want to show you that uh, so you can see what I mean when I say a juicy game. Every single thing you do in Meow Pow, every single hit, every bump, every score, just is loaded with effects, right? It's just layered on layered and layered, um, and that's what we'll be going through. So uh, that's our first example. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Uh, excuse me. Should be going to the. There we go. Cool. So uh, let's define like more more technical than just uh, feely stuff. But but what is juice, right? So uh, juice or or game feel they kind of uh, have overlapping terms uh, is an intangible tactile sensation you experience when interacting with a video game. Uh, so really, it's like if you strip away pretty much everything in the game, right? You strip away uh, the the goals and the, the upgrades and all that extra stuff, and you just have you know, in pure interactions, uh, is, is that interesting, right? It's a totally white boxed area. Can that, can that be interesting? And if it is, then you have pretty good game feel. Um, and we could judge it a few different ways, but that's like um, very baseline. Uh, Steve Swink in his uh, book that I have right over here, uh, titled Game Feel, uh, he defined it uh, there's like seven different types of game feel, but uh, pure game feel was this middle part that we're pointing to, uh, where polish, uh, spatial simulation, and real-time control overlapped. And that's not the only definition, but that is that is definition. His, his book covered, that's kind of the definition we're going to be going with. Um, 
personally, I don't think real-time control is super important uh, because I, I think like someone watching the game can still have some sort of uh, game feel, even if, or like if it's not a real-time game, but you know, that's, that's debatable. Okay, great. So what can we juice in a game, right? Uh, there's so many moving parts to a game, but uh, there are six parts in a game that we can really mess with to create better game feel. So uh, we can change the input, the response, the context, the static, metaphor, and the rules. Uh, so let's go over those and see what, uh, you know, what juicy examples of those would be. So first we have input. So it's the mapping of, of buttons or just how you interact with the game. Uh, and it, it, you know, a good feel. So this right here is a super, super dinner table flipping, uh, which is, I really enjoy the game. They have, uh, or they used to have it. I don't know if they still have it at the uh, Chinatown fair in Chinatown. Uh, and it's, it's a fantastic game because in the game, uh, you're at dinner very angry and you bang on the table and you literally slam your fist down on the table and you just keep banging on the table till you get so angry you flip it. And it's, it's a one-to-one, -one. you feel like you're really in the game because you're doing all those same interactions. Um, so this is, this is excellent like input feel. Uh, something like you know, Angry Birds could be another example where you're like literally pulling back and releasing uh, and the characters in the game are, are being slingshot. Um, so you really wanna have to, in order to have a juicy game, you really wanna have that uh, player action mimicking in-game in action. Okay. So next is response. So uh, the response can kind of change how uh, we sense things, right? So a uh, slow response uh, to player input uh, would really make the character feel like kind of heavy and slow versus like a very quick response could make the character feel like light and, and maybe frantic. Uh, so each designer would really want to like tune this to, to get the uh, the game feel the right way that they, they'd want. Um, where, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. Uh, anyway, so th they'd really wanted to like uh, finely tune this responsiveness so they get the uh, in-game field to be proper. Um, so this is uh, this gif right here is Deli Bird's delivery mini game from Pokemon Stadium Two, and what I like about it is uh, you play as Deli Bird, it's Pokemon uh, second gen. I'm not too familiar with, but anyway, what was fun about it was you're filling up this um, bag of toys and trying to carry it to the conveyor belt, and if you fill up your bag really big your character would move really slow and feel very unresponsive and sluggish. But you'd, you'd be jamming on that stick, trying to just get right to the goal faster than the other guy who only had one item and was running. And it kind of like like um, played into uh, the, the challenge of the game too, where you'd have to uh, measure up speed against you know items and it was really fun, but uh, a really good game feel and used response in a, in a really interesting way. Okay, then we have context, right? So context is taking the input and uh, the response, and uh, it's kind of like, you have to have, it's, sorry, requiring them, uh, it makes the input and the response require an environment uh, in order to give meaning to the player's actions. So this GIF is something I mocked up quickly before, and uh, that cube is actually moving the entire time, right? But you don't notice that the cube is moving at all. Uh, until the cube goes onto that uh, UV background, because it just feels like uh, it's in a void, and you you don't you get don't get a sense of uh, movement or action or you know that that cube could be standing still, it could be moving you know a thousand feet a second. Um, so the context of which these uh, inputs and responses are happening is is also very important to game feel. Okay. Uh, next we have a static. Uh, so it's all the, the extra little details, all of the beeps and boops and particles and all that stuff that just really uh, makes the experience overall engaging to the player. Uh, metaphor. So this one's fun. So uh, it's how the game's mechanics relate to the game's themes. So I'm sure you've played games that were like a pretty big uh, mismatch uh, of the two and that would have like not great game feel. Uh, and you know, here we have example of it. So uh, it's the Kool Aid Man. Uh, this is a mod of Left 4 Dead. Uh, I think it's the first one. And uh, oh no, it was the second one. Okay, so it's the second one. Uh, and it, where they replaced the tank in the game uh, with the Kool Aid Man. And the reason why this is not good game feel. I mean, it's 
it's okay. Uh, the Kool-Aid Man slash tank burst through walls, right? That makes sense for both characters. Uh, but then it's the Kool-Aid Man trying to kill you, which uh, means there's, there's a little bit of a mismatch with the, the theme at that point. So uh, mods are probably a really good example of just messed up metaphors. Um, I'm sure you've played other games with it, though. Okay, rules, uh, rules are rules, right? That's it. Uh, uh, if you make bad rules to your game, the game won't feel good. That one's pretty simple. Okay, great. So uh, let's let's see. What is juice? Juice for those six uh, six pieces, right? Uh, but we're really going to focus on just one of those. We're going to focus on aesthetics. Okay. Okay. So the way I like to do this is uh, we use the uh, the principles of animations, right? Um, and they can be used uh, for any kind of polish to fit into the game world, either audio or visual. The examples I'm going to be using are uh, visual, and the only reason they're visual is because uh, that's where I'm better as as a designer. I've always worked with. Um, uh, a sound designer as well, and they kind of uh, made the game feel for the uh, all, the all the sound design stuff. Uh, I worked with them, but it was never what I was in charge of, so I didn't want to put those examples in. Anyway, the 12 principles of animation, uh, they create an illusion that the cartoon characters adhere to the basic laws of physics. So uh, by adding those and by thinking about those ideas when we're adding game feel means uh, it'll kind of make the, the game worlds that we're existing in and that we're playing in feel like a, a, a physical space. Okay, so these are the 12 principles of animation, uh, but, but six of them are not important. Uh, we're, we're really only going to be using uh, the other six, and uh, yeah, we're, we'll go over them one by one. Okay, so uh, for First up, we have uh, squash and stretch. So squash and stretch gives a sense of weight and flexibility that can be uh, that can convey speed, weight, mass, material, and even force. Right. So uh, the way we can uh, do this is, or the way that it does this, is by how much it actually moves. Right. So if you have like a bowling ball and you drop it. In, in real life, a bowling ball is not gonna squish at all, right? Versus if you have uh, a dodgeball or something that's really gonna squash. Um, we wanna exaggerate these things, and we're gonna talk about that uh, in a few slides. But um, you know, we can start to show uh, material that way. Uh, we can show impact force, right? Because if you hit a dodgeball a little bit, it might still wiggle, but it's not gonna squash and stretch. Um, and we can really like kind of do like a reverb thing on audio as well. We want to apply this audio. Cool. Let's uh, let's see an example of squash and stretch. All right. So here we have a video ball by Action Button Entertainment, 2016, and you can see the balls here uh, are squashing and stretching every time uh, you interact with them. But they're really just like you know wiggling a little, uh, but you still get the sense that they are made of rubber, right? And video ball is meant to be. Um, kind of a sports-like game, so I think we can safely assume that they are meant to be like a rubber sports ball. So we also did something very similar to this in uh, Meow Pow, where uh, we didn't, I mean, we wiggled the ball as well when you hit it, but more so when the ball was moving, we had it uh, uh, stretch in the direction of the velocity. And so with, that's what uh, objects do in real life, right? When they're going very fast, um, they get pulled in at the sides and then stretch out in the direction of velocity. Um, and then when it hits an object, it like squash back in. So uh, that also made the ball feel really light and just players love that effect. So uh, next we have uh, anticipation, right? So uh, anticipation would prepare the audience for an action uh, and make the action appear more realistic. Um, this can also be used uh, as telegraphing in games. Uh, if anyone does know uh, telegraphing, telegraphing is when a um, uh, you're kind of alerting the player of another action that's about to happen. Uh, usually, like uh, if if something is going to kill them or you want to get their attention, uh, you would like you know flash three times and then like a spike comes up, right? You telegraph that action. Okay, and uh, what anticipation does also, other than telegraphing, um, it it kind of like is the build-up force before you're actually able to do an action. 
uh, you know, no one just stands straight up and jumps, right? They bend their knees and then jump uh, because they have to like build up the force to do that. So, so uh, that's how, you know, that's anticipation. So an example of that is a mini Metro by Dinosaur uh, Polo Club in 2014. And uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Yeah, great. So right here we can see there's some like anticipation building up just of the rings closing. And the rings mean uh, if the rings close, you lose the game. So uh, the ring's slowly closing and uh, look at that, there's squash and stretch again. The icon for that uh, subway station is squashing and stretching and bouncing and kind of just like alerting the player that uh, you're, you're about to lose, right? It's building up this anticipation of the lose. It's also kind of building tension. So uh, that's a really great thing to use. So uh, next up, we have uh, follow through. Uh, it's kind of like an, the opposite of, uh, of anticipation, right? So uh, momentum continues for a short amount of time after an action ends, right? Uh, just like we don't just jump with a straight legs, we don't land straight on our legs or we, we would probably break our knees, um, right? We land and we kind of like catch ourselves. We, there's follow through, there's always follow through on like pretty much every action. So every one of uh, your in-game actions ha should have like a follow through of some type, right? Um, so if a player is running really fast, they shouldn't stop on a dime. Maybe they skid a little, or maybe they do stop on a dime. So it feels responsive, but then there's like dust particles that shoot up because those dust particles will be the follow through, right? The force that continues from the player, even though they stopped. Um, or uh, kind of if an object explodes, you have a little smoke afterwards, uh, there's a follow through of that action. You're just, you're keeping that action going slowly, right? It just, it fades out over time. You don't just stop any action. Uh, so the example here, we have a uh, skate story. Um, the, the series name is by Sam Ang. It's to be announced. Um, Sam, who is working on this is actually part of uh, Gumbo, so it's right over there. Um, and uh, I really like this, this example uh, because it's like, it's a skateboarding game. You're using the skateboard for everything. But uh, you know, it directly affects the player. Uh, the skateboard is going, it, stop, it comes to a, a complete stop, right? But there's fall through in the player's action. The player falls off and shatters. And then even further, like some of those crystal shards go, it, it keeps up the momentum. Okay, so next we have uh, slow in, slow out. Uh, this can be known as like easing, but um, you know, assuming your game doesn't take place in like a frictionless vacuum, then any force that's applied to anything in your game, uh, whether it's a, a player or or a particle effect, or I guess this one can apply to audio. Um, but uh, it should it should build up, right? You you would build up to like full speed, and then you don't again stop on a dime unless you have some sort of follow through. Uh, you would you know slow down and gradually uh, come come to a stop. And for this, we have uh, what the golf by Triband twenty twenty. Uh, there is like that initial hard force when, when you're hitting, when this player's moving in initially. I mean, it, it's hit force, but it kind of like builds up some speed. Uh, the slow out happens though, right? It, it hits something, it slows down, it comes to, comes to an end. Great. Excuse me one second. Great, so now we have the arc, okay? So an arc is uh, the most natural actions tend to follow an arc's trajectory. Um, animation, or game feel in this case, should adhere to the principle by following uh, implied arcs for greater realism. Uh, things don't move in linear patterns. Nothing in the world uh, moves in linear patterns. Uh, the world is round, I'm sorry for saying something so controversial. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, anything, you know, you throw something in a straight line, it's your roll, a bowling ball, it's technically moving on an arc, a very small arc. Um, yeah, so let's see an example. Uh, Towerfall Ac uh, Ascension by Extremely OK Games 2014. This is, a, this is one of my favorite games. Uh, but you can see the character's always moving in an arc. And even if, uh, you'll see in a second, when they shoot uh, some arrows, right? Right, they have a nice little curve to them. Even though they're going up, they still curve back down. Um, but even if the character was jumping uh, up and down, technically it's like a, it's a 1D arc, right? Because they would uh, apply a force initially going up 
and they'd go up and up until like uh, gravity takes over and then they'd like stop for a moment and then apply force down at a, um, at a continuous rate. So it's like quick up, uh, I guess we can do it in two ways. So, so it's like a quick up and uh, you know, you know, slow and then quick back down. Uh, so it is an arc, right? Everything moves in arc, it feels more natural. Uh, I'm a big fan of using animation curves. I think animation curves make everything feel so much better uh, just non, non-linear anything, non-linear uh, increasing of speeds, decreasing for everything. Use uh, an arc or a curve or just, yeah, just fading, you know, some sort of subtlety that is non-linear. It's, it's such a small change and all of these things are just very, very um, small to do. Uh, but like you add them all up and they just, it completely changes your game. Okay, and then here we have exaggeration, right? Uh, so uh, a perfect one-to-one -one of reality, uh, it, it's tough, right? It's not, even from like, if, even if it wasn't tough from a technical standpoint, but um, people don't pick up on subtleties of other people's behavior sometimes, uh, which lead to fights very often between people. Uh, so we don't want that in our games, right? We don't want those subtleties that are open to interpretation. Uh, you want to overemphasize everything. You want to make sure that 100% of people who are uh, playing your games understand what's happening, right? So we want to exaggerate every little action um, that, to the point where uh, it's, it's impossible to, to misinterpret this action. So an example for this uh, is Splunky, right? So in this scene, you have the uh, the main character, or I guess one, one of the main characters that you have to unlock. Uh, he's fighting the snakes, and then the spider right here. And it just explodes in like three blood drops, which is ridiculous uh, on a bunch of levels. But it's it's like there's, there's no way you're not understanding that you're killing those snakes and spider, right? Uh, it's... It's over the top. It's ridiculous. Like the blood drops are the same size as the spider, and there's three of them. Like that's more blood than spider. That's that's ridiculous. So um, yeah, they use it, uh, here. Uh, Moss Mouth uses exaggeration to really sell the facts. The player, okay, uh, the is really selling the fact that the player uh, destroyed this uh, or these enemies. It's more than one. Okay, cool. So at this point, now you're asking, how can we apply this to the, to our games, right? Uh, what is the in so uh, we, we we can think about this like uh, in two ways to apply these uh, now six principles of animation into our games, right? So uh, ask yourself two things: what is the intent of this action, and what is the player supposed to feel uh, or know about this this particular uh, player action or action that's happening in my game, right? So uh, we can break these into a bunch of different categories. Uh, right now, I've, I've thought about this. I've broken into like six categories and then you know, five, four, and now I'm on three. And I think these three really sum up uh, all the things that you'd kind of want to give to your player. Okay, so those three that we're going to focus on is uh, or are tactility, information, and tension. So let's uh, let's go over those right now. So first up, uh, tactility, right? So um, this is a nuclear throne by Vlambeer. They're like, I'm sure you know if you're in this talk, you're interested in the juice. Uh, you've probably seen JW's talk on juice, which is great. And he gives like really, really great examples for uh, people making action games. Uh, so tactility is the, uh, the capability of being felt or touched, um, which is weird, right? Because these are digital objects. You can't feel or touch digital objects. So, so what do we do, right? So if we're trying to make the world feel more real uh, or tell the player that they exist in a physical space, uh, we would want to give a, a sort of tactile feedback, right? So this example, uh, every time the gun is fired or that barrel in the back there explodes, um, there's screen shake, right? So that implies that the camera actually exists in this actual physical space, right? And these actions are just so powerful that there's a shockwave going off because of them 
and it's hitting the camera and the camera's moving a little bit because of it. So we're mimicking these real world actions uh, in a way that uh, just makes the player feel like they're really there. Um, a lot of movies do this as well. Uh, so yeah, it's great. So these, this, uh, something like this too could be layered on with all those other ideas that I've said, right? Where uh, you can do a slow in, slow out, or you can smooth that. Um, you can have a follow through, you can move camera in kind of arc pattern. Uh, and you just start to, to layer these things to make, um, make your game extra juicy. Okay, so next up uh, we have information, right? So information gives some detail about what is going on in this game. Uh, so in this example, it's a Pikmin 3 by Nintendo. And uh, it's using it's doing like two different things to tell the player uh, they're losing Pikmin, right? Their Pikmin are dying. Uh, so as you can see on the strawberry monster's face, when it first eats the Pikmin, there's a bunch of sparks that fly up. And then uh, kind of like kind of like a follow through, right? Uh, the ghosts hang around and uh, they they tell the the player, your Pikmin are dead, but also uh, which exactly which ones, right? There's there's a color to the ghost, um, so it's it's giving the player some some information. And uh, yeah, so these things also kind of have. Well, let's look. So uh, yeah, they kind of have some arc. Uh, I guess they have arcing in the way that the sparks kind of like fade out over time, right? They don't just turn off, right? They they have this uh, nonlinear fade. Uh, that's happening, and same thing with the ghosts. They have this like kind of wobble, which could be kind of like a, a squash and stretch effect. Um, and there's definitely follow through. It's great, all sorts of stuff. And the third one uh, that we'll talk about is tension, right? So tension is your body reacting to a challenge or a demand. So you're kind of like adding tension to make the player really feel that stress that their player or that their character in the game is feeling. So here we have Noita by uh, Nola Games. And what's happening is the player got hit and their health is down really low. So the, the screen flashes and fades um, dark red. And it tells the player like, oh no, I better watch out. And uh, this particular player didn't watch out and dodge in the next frame. Uh, but right, but that's adding like so much tension uh, and stressing the player out so bad, but uh, it's such a, such a simple little thing. Okay, so uh, what, what does this mean for my game, right? So I felt weird putting this in a talk and just telling you what to do because everyone's game should be super unique uh, and you don't really wanna just give, or I really don't wanna give like super specific actionable things to do, uh, but rather things to think about while you're designing. Um, there are some rules you can follow, like we just went over and, you know, uh, a few more, but uh, yeah, just don't don't just uh, copy exactly what someone else did. Try some new weird stuff. Uh, but the first rule I think that uh, should be applied to everything uh, is this: the intensity of uh, the feedback or the juice should e be equal to the importance of the action that is being juiced. Right. So this is my uh, upside down pyramid. I don't know if that shape has a has a specific name, might. I don't know it. <laughs> so uh, we want to scale these things. We want to uh, in different ways, right? Because if every single action in your game is important, then then they're all equally unimportant as well, right? the The order of this list is totally subjective and different for every game. Uh, this is just how I would do it. Um, but but use this kind of idea for your game, right? So we can see. If your player at the very top level is destroyed, we have a particle effect, a sound effect, uh, a screen shake, a time slowdown, a time warp, a fade out, a volume change, right? All of those things. Versus when the player is just moving, uh, you have particles and sound. So the player being destroyed is the most important thing, right? You want to 100% make sure there is no way that the player is missing <laughs> that they just lost the game, right? That their player got destroyed or they're using up one of their lives or something like that. Um, for movement, they should probably understand that uh, their their character's moving, uh, but you don't necessarily need to scream it in their face in the same way. Um, and then I just put core mechanic as the second from the top here because 
typically the core mechanics, the thing the player is doing a lot. You want to really kind of have a lot of effects on that and make that feel really good. Um, and then damage below that because, and damage and scoring, and there might be other stuff, but damage, uh, again, you want to make sure it's very, very obvious that that player is taking damage so they know, like, oh no, I'm not playing really well, I might lose. Uh, and then scoring would be the next one down for me uh, because you want to do the opposite of damage. You want to tell them when they're doing super well. Um, the only reason I think damage and scoring should be in this order uh, is because damage damage is kind of finite, right? Like eventually you would just get so much damage the game ends versus scoring is not finite. Uh, you can score almost indefinitely. Um, but maybe it should move around. Uh, I don't know. I think most games it would be like this. Great. Okay, cool. So uh, this one is, I think, maybe a little controversial. Uh, I've heard, uh, kind of heard it go both ways, but uh, th this is how I feel. Juice early, juice often. Um, you should just constantly, your first prototype, just put a lot of juice into it. Uh, this is uh, on the left here. We have what Meow Pal looked like after one month of development. On the right, it's one year. Like probably like 60, 70% of the juice is there uh, from the first prototype. And I showed it off. There, there's a bunch of sound effects in here too. Um, actually, all the sound effects are, are in the first uh, one month one, not the final ones, like free ones. Uh, but everyone really liked the first version. And I was very surprised because I'm like, oh, all you're doing is hitting a ball around. And people were like, oh, I love how it jiggles. I love how this flashes. Uh, the sound effects are, are funny because they were like, very anime sounding, just like smashes and punches. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it really informs kind of like the direction of the game overall. Uh, and it, it kind of gave me the confidence to keep going with this particular design and knowing that uh, it was engaging enough. Now, now this game is still, uh, you know, very, very small scale. So uh, if it wasn't, that's fine. Uh, if it wasn't actually good, you know, I didn't waste that much time, but uh, the juice, the juice saved this, right? The juice made this design what it was. So uh, as soon as you have a prototype you think is interesting, just throw everything in there. Great. So another action you can take is uh, make the core mechanic and uh, maybe one other feature, right? And then put it in an empty room and and juice it. So uh, there's a this is. Uh, if anyone knows who this is from, uh, this is a GIF I found online. Uh, please let me know uh, so I can credit them. But uh, yeah, this is this is kind of perfect, right? So this is interesting already. There's just a bunch of white boxes and a grappling hook, and it, it seems like that's kind of fun. And this can inform other design decisions, but also uh, it just seems like a game I'd want to already play around in. Which, if we you know went all the way back to our uh, like third or fourth slide, uh, it said that game feel is uh, pretty much, is it still interesting when we strip everything else out? That's exactly this. You know, that's that's what we did on this one month with Meow Pow. There's core feature and just white box. Uh, and it's interesting. So we know we have good game feel. And going forwards, uh, we are we can just, we know the final version of the game will also have good game feel. Okay. Next, okay. So last action you can take is, uh, this is something I do a lot and uh, my business partner doesn't really care for this, but uh, he's not in charge of this, so that's fine. <laughs> um, so it's put in as many effects as you can think of, right? Just every stupid thing, it doesn't matter if it makes sense or not, um, just, just all of them. And then start scaling them back, right? Uh, because you're not necessarily going to know if it makes sense to uh, put in like explosion particle on a button click until you do it, right? It's it might sound good in your head, it might sound bad in your head, but uh, really you're not going to know until you try it. Um, you know we have to obviously keep this in mind, right? We don't probably want uh, the first menu system to be all explosions because. Uh, that would mean you're kind of like jumping the shark, right? Oh, if the menu is this insane and over the top juicy, what is the rest of the game going to be like, right? And then you're spent you know, three years in development just doing nothing but uh, juicing your game. 
or it's a total letdown because you have over the top menus and really boring gameplay. But um, again, just throw everything in there, right? Um, look at other games. Look at uh, look at movies. Look at anime. Look at you know other cartoons. Just anything you think is interesting. Just try making your game. Throw it on on an action. See how it feels, um, and then scale back until it's kind of right. It's right for uh, the importance of that action. It's right for uh, the feedback it should be giving the player. It's communicating the right thing. It's giving tension or information or tactility. Just uh, use your own best judgment. Uh, you're all probably designers, developers here. I'm sure you have good judgment. So um, you know, trust yourself and and try the stuff out. And um, yeah, that's about it. So uh, I think I'm coming in uh, a little bit. Uh, that's it. Uh, under where I should be. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, You're good, John. You're great. good. Thank you so much. All right, let's, uh, let's, dr let's drop this right here. Go to right here. I like how you approached it from the uh, fundamentals of animation. I'm a 3D animator, too. Um, cool. Did you ever see the video from 2012, Juice It or Lose It? Yes. Yes, that's yeah, like excellent. I feel like this was inspired, but kind of from an animator's perspective as well. And mm -hmm. I like it's like you look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, that totally makes sense. You press a button. If it mm -hmm. doesn't do anything, then it doesn't it doesn't feel. But if you press a button and it moves, yep. boop, then that's something totally different. I, I yeah, love that kind of stuff. I think game. juice juice makes a game really because you play a game oh, and you're like, oh, this is kind of fun. You add a bunch of juice to it, and it's it's way more way more fun. All oh, right, yeah. so let's see. Let's get to some questions right here. It can't be both. Oh, here's a comment. Can't be both intangible and tactile. Those are opposites. <laughs> and then um, he Fair. said, maybe intangible in concept, but tactile in execution. Fair. All right, so you got some questions? Oh, here we go. Here, I'll do it like this. Can there be too much chance? I, I don't know. Is there too much reverb in that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think that goes back to what I was saying about the intensity, right? Uh, yes, a game can have too much juice, um, but it, it depends on a couple of things. Uh, it depends on who you are, because uh, I know I've definitely put in like a ton of screen shake and particles and like sound effects. And then I've had people play it and be like, this is, I can't play this, I feel sick. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, you want to make sure that uh, certain actions are super juicy over the top. Um, you know, like I said, if, if your player is destroyed and it's game over, put up all the juice, right? Tell a player like, oh, you messed up. Or if you've just won the game, do the same thing. Like, oh, you've won, like it's over the top. Um, saying that, uh, some criticism we got uh, from an early demo of Meow Pow was they wanted to be able to turn down the screen shake, turn off all the flashing effects, turn off the particles and all of that. So we put all of that into menu. Um, just be considerate to your players. Um, you know, go over the top, play test it, put in some options. Uh, so I always, yeah. always, always turn off screen shake. I don't like it. Yeah. I don't like it. But you know, I like to exaggerate stuff. Even if it's a character, mm -hmm. like if you're doing animation on a character that's real, like if I mm -hmm. just grab a pencil and and you animate a character doing that. That mm -hmm. is boring, right? Even if it's like, even if it's rotoscoped or whatever. But if I'm holding a pencil right here and I'm, and, and let's see my hands over here and I'm like this, grab the pencil and do mm -hmm. that. That's way more interesting. Even if it's not realistically, how are you going to grab a pencil? It's yeah. just way more interesting and immersive. Um, Luigi's game said, so one could say that both the shape and speed of motion are a curve. Yeah. Uh, so the, sh the shape, Yes, yes. Uh, the, the shape of motion. So, like, I guess the direction, like how it moves across the screen. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, the speed, one hundred percent, would be a curve. Um, yeah, that's how I do all of my my curving, all of my movements, all of my uh, speed increases over time. I use the animation curve, and it just kind of figures out, uh, like a like as a multiplier. Or do you do you when you do 3D stuff? Do you animate in Maya or? Um. So those those 3D stuff, I didn't anim I didn't model any of the, and uh, I didn't model any of the stuff for Meow Pow. Uh, I did all of the 2D assets. Uh, we had but another. Did you animate stuff? Up. Not for not for Meow Pow. Mm. 
Okay, let's see. And I love that. The like the slow out for disappearing. Yes, it doesn't have to just be a movement like where you're mm -hmm. going fast and then you start go slow. Right? Mm -hmm. It can be fading in and then fading out really slow. Yeah, yep. I like that. Or like um, popping in like it cur it doesn't just like yeah, turn like turn on a full uh, size, it just like a half a second it grows, right? And mm -hmm. then slowly fades. Like I do everything like that. I never like to pop things in. Oh uh, yeah, William Payne says, I was wondering how you would figure out if what juice you added was too much. Uh, uh, don't let your mom play it because she'll go, this is perfect. This is, you're so talented, right? Uh, I, I always I always found the opposite. But, um, really? Your mom was hard? <laughs> this sucks, uh, she, son. Yeah, she she was not, uh, she did not like video games. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it's more like showing someone else, right? Uh, I'm very lucky that I'm, in a developer co-op, uh, we're in the collective. I have other developers to show and then be like, oh, I'll pull it back a little. But, um, you know, show it to players if you can, bring it to events, uh, post some screenshots on Reddit, post it on uh, Twitter, uh, all over the place. And people will tell you what they think, whether you want them to or not. <laughs> yeah, post on Reddit if you want someone to just poop all over your game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cat made that, I, and I can actually answer a little bit of this question. Mm -hmm. Within larger studios, are there specific people tasked with adding juice to a game, or is it mostly for animators? I can tell you this: I know somebody that worked at Ubisoft, and they were an animator, and the only thing they animated was fingers. That was it. They didn't animate <laughs> anything else, just fingers. So I, I would guess, depending on the studio, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at uh, at my studio, I do all of it uh, just because I'm better at it. Uh, mm. But yeah, I've I've heard uh, like was it that game company a few years ago had a had a job for like a feel engineer, um, which seems like a amazing job. Yeah. Uh, oh, here we go. Opposite of a pyramid is a piramigo. I actually want to look that up and see what that looks like. Okay, great. Is, is, it, <laughs> is it an upside down pyramid or is it an inside out pyramid? Or I'm just curious about that. Okay, uh, that let's great. see. I learned this. Oh, I learned this stuff as player feedback, but I will be calling it juice from now on. Perfect. Great. I, I feel like everyone just calls it like game feel, juice, you know, feedback. Uh, sometimes polish, but you see like polish is like part of it all. Mm -hmm. Just make your things exaggerated and make them big. Um, how do you start giving it juice? For me, I get overwhelmed when starting a project, so anything helps. Yeah. Uh, so. I have I have a, a script I just call a juice controller and it just has like a bunch of methods I've made on it from previous projects uh, and I just start calling that right so it has like flash black flash white um, you know scale up scale down uh, over a curve um, and I just put that on you know the the player moves and bumps into a wall just it's it squashes and stretches a bit maybe it just puts a particle effect in there um, mm -hmm. it it can be definitely overwhelming but. Uh, you know, like I was saying in one of the, the last slides, just put everything on there. Um, and then eventually you'll see like, eh, this is too much compared to some of the other things. I'm going to remove one or two of these effects. Um, so yeah, just put on as much as you can. I think squash and stretch is probably the easiest one because it just makes everything feel alive and like it's moving and it's part of a, a real world. Yeah, I, I do know that with uh, animation though, when you're mm -hmm. like when you're animating something, it's better to over animate it and dial it back than it is to under animate it and try and push it, push it, push it. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, Brian just totally messed with us. He says it is a dad joke. Id versus ego. So pyramid, pyramigo. Mm -hmm. that, that is a bad. <laughs> you're, you know what? You're fired. You're banned. I'm gonna I'm gonna time you out right now just for that. Yeah, you should have whooshed all of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. Well, do you got any last words? Um. No, uh, if you want to send me your games for feedback on Juice, I love talking about this stuff. Uh, feel free to send me a demo. My email is in the last slide. I don't know if you still see the slide. Right, let's pop that sucker up again. Boop. Oh, there we go. Wait, wait, wait. That one. There we go. Yeah, John, so, uh, oh, oh, let's get rid of that comment. So, Okay. John yeah, at Cheap Ramen Discord. Games. Yeah. Oh, the nice Discord. Also, we are at discord.gg slash indie game business. If you want to come in there and hang out for a little bit in the post comment, ch post chat comments, uh, that would be awesome. Great. All right, Jay's Jay's here. Everyone, shh. No, the, um, the Discord's actually been crazy today. It's awesome. We have like all this new blood coming in and the career sessions and the 
feedback. We <laughs> we didn't realize 70 some people could be in that room at one time, but they can. And right now we opened up a soundstage. So we've got audio folks sharing and rating and giving feedback on, on music and audio stuff. So we will That's be back so cool. again tomorrow morning, bright and early, 9 a.m. I'm up at 5 a.m., everyone. Yeah. Thank <laughs> me. I mean, thank you. <laughs> um, and then, so we've got another full day, 12 hours tomorrow, and then again on Friday. So, yeah. John, thanks for closing us out on day yeah, one. Yeah, thank you, John. That That's, was an awesome talk and, and amazing talk. I, I, we appreciate your wisdom and knowledge. It was awesome. It was great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you all. We'll, we'll see, we'll see you tomorrow, tomorrow, bright and early, and I'll head us out of here. <laughs>